Um, and um, so, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to um, join today and learn about the Evaluation Work Project. I'm Beth Holtzman, I'm with UVM Extension, and I'll be facilitating the session along with Kate McGowan from Marlboro College's Center for New Leadership. Um, and okay, so here's our agenda for the day. Um, we um, are gonna just quickly go over our agenda and then we'll talk a little bit about the context for the project, what we anticipate um, for how it's gonna work, the logistics and format and our topics. And then um, we're gonna turn it over to you to hear um, what your questions are and also about any um, things you'd really like to see incorporated into this program. Um, so the context for the project, um, this is a project that's funded by the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, and it's the Vermont State Program. Um, SARE has a coordinator for each state. In Vermont, that's me. It's a part-time position, and I started as the state coordinator in early 2018. Um, and in addition to conducting outreach about SARE opportunities and the results of its grant funded projects, I'm responsible for um, offering professional development to improve sustainable ag programs. Um, and this project um, started with me doing a needs assessment to see what our agricultural educators and service providers had already identified um, as their priorities for professional development. So I looked at um, uh, multiple years of surveys of extension personnel, um, as well as a farm viability survey, and I also conducted my own interviews. And um, what what came out was, whoops, I'm, things are flying there. Uh, so um, what what came out was that program evaluation emerged as a priority topic. Um, people talked a lot about the challenges they encounter about implementing evaluation that meets both funders' requirements and is practical and useful for understanding their programs, how they work well, and what um, we can do to have even more impact at the farm level. Um, so part of this is that UVM Extension has not had an evaluation faculty specialist or staff coordinator or um, curriculum coordinator since at least 2005. So evaluation has become the responsibility of the faculty and staff who deliver programs. Um, and so the idea here is to bring together a group of um, professionals to work together to learn and apply evaluation concepts and approaches in their work to amplify their impacts. Um, I want to really stress that this is not a make work project. The goal is to help um, participants do the kinds of evaluation that you need to do anyway, um, but to do it more efficiently and effectively. Um, the professional development will help you make sure you're asking the right questions, that you're collecting the right data for your program, and hopefully um, to make sure that you aren't spending time and effort collecting and managing data that isn't really useful. Um, You'll have access through the project to expertise and support to analyze the information you have and um, to use it to um, make modifications to your programs if you think that you want to, um, to increase benefits for farmers and the environment. Um, and um, you know, in the end, you'll have um, an expanded set of skills and um, a network of colleagues that you can use to apply to future programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. So I guess uh, on this part, she's best already covered a little bit of this, but what we're really hoping is that this is a gift of time and information and relationship for you. Uh, so really building on what you already know and also what's emerging as best practices in the spaces that you don't know much about, if there are spaces like that, but also really rooted in being practical. So uh, one of the things that, that I feel very strongly about is if we take people's time and training, it better be useful right now, not three years from now, but applicable immediately. So again, building on what you already do, but maybe create more efficiencies in it. Um, identify what you want to know and then build the tools to get you there. 
um, and then use the time together to do the work so that it's not just an academic exercise, that it's really a practical use of your time because we know that time is precious. For, for Beth in particular, she has also some funder requirements and some of her own work requirements so that there will be, there will be assessment tools that are used along the way, but there'll be good models of the work that you're learning, but uh, also making sure they're not burdensome to you or to Beth, because again, nobody has time for um, redundancies or too much time spent on this. So just sort of a warning that there are pre-assessments and assessments along the way, but they might actually be a learning opportunity and we promise that they won't be a burden. Um, the other piece, I guess the real logistics part, because you're asking if this is a long-term project, there is an application uh, process to, to get on board, and that's due on 1221. It's a pretty straightforward application. Uh, we're going to try to our, the best of our capacity to decide every, the um, acceptance by the end of that day. So if you are thinking about applying, you could apply starting today. You don't have to wait till 5 o'clock on the 21st because that would be kind of hard for us to uh, manage. So if you all do that a little early, we thank you in advance. Uh, and then we'll have a pre-assessment tool that we're currently designing and wanted to hear a little bit from you before we do that, um, that will be available in January. And this is gonna be used, one, to, to start setting um, and refining the agenda for the trainings and the topics that we want to cover and also to be used to place you in um, smaller peer learning circles, which I'll explain a little more about. The design of the program, again, in service to time and the fact that we're in Vermont in, um, you know, all in distant places, there's two mountain ranges and a very long winter. It's going to be a combination of in-person and online, and it's also going to be a combination of large group learning and the peer learning circles. Go ahead, Beth, and change that slide. Uh, the reason that we're using peer learning circles is uh, that there's a lot of research um, that's sort of coming out and talking about adult learning and the importance and the value of moving into smaller, more intimate settings for learning and accountability and conversation. And, and I just pulled a little bit of information from the um, Human Resources Council of Canada and the Community Foundations of Canada. I'm kind of a fan of the Canadians these days. And the, the results of a, a long-term study that they did just talked about the benefits of um, really breaking into small cohorts uh, is that there's a more, um, more opportunity to share your ideas and your perspectives and to hear one another, that it does help with uh, creative problem solving more so than in larger groups. So if you have a group of trusted peers that you can say, okay, this is what I'm trying to do, that there's uh, increased willingness to participate in that, in that process, uh, that you can really uh, hammer into the strengths and weaknesses of the various tools that we're gonna share with you, that you can test them and pilot them and say, okay, this worked, was it me or was it the tool? Is it something worth pursuing or not pursuing? And you with your trusted group can, can make some uh, better decisions. I think a really important, really important part of this, and uh, my experience in, in the work in the nonprofit sector in particular, is that sometimes it's isolating. And so um, that you just feel isolated and you're sort of calling things as you go and there's not enough time to, to gather and, um, and get out of that going it alone. So hopefully it's an opportunity for you to not feel that way and to, and to have a group that's going with you. And again, all of this serves to your increased effectiveness accountability, because if you say to your small group that you're gonna do something, they're gonna hold you accountable to that the next time you meet. Um, and then also, uh, the beauty of developing those relationships while you're being supported by this learning project is that it has the potential to go on beyond the scope of this project, because you have developed working relationships with other people. So we're hoping that that will be part of what happens too. Next slide, Beth. So more importantly, probably than that, is the logistics. And what we're envisioning is about an hour, an hour and a half a month of formal time together. We're gonna to alternate between the large group webinars and your small group peer learning circles, which will also be online. And um, after the first couple, you'll get to decide what the convenient time is to meet. But the first few will be supported by Beth and myself. That there's gonna be one in-person full day training uh, per year. And then it's your own work. So again, this is, uh, this is for you and you'll get out of it what you put into it. So as you are um, given various tools, it's up to you to pilot and test them and you can choose to do so or not to do so to your 
um, to the level of your comfort zone, interest, and um, time available. So that's up to you. But what we're sort of looking at at this point is that February and March, uh, early February and March over lunch, there'll be a webinar one and two, and then we'll have an in-person. We'll send out a doodle poll to find out what the most convenient of these options are, uh, and that'll be all day in, in central Vermont. Uh, at that point, we'll put you into your peer learning circle based on your assessment and sort of watching you in action in the webinar and in person because more things will we'll, we'll be able to observe more about what the right uh, partnership group is for you. Uh, so you'll have your, per, your peer learning circle in um, April. And what we'll do is we'll support you. We'll give you some options for about an hour long meeting, orient you to the work and, and what can happen in those and what those agendas could look like. Then another webinar in May, and then a peer learning circle in June, and so on and so forth. So really alternating uh, back and forth between those two opportunities. And the next slide has to do with some of the topics that we thought we would cover. So the things that have come to mind out of the needs assessment and out of our own areas of expertise and observation, there's a whole array of things, but really it boils down to the left column being some big overarching things. You know, uh, what does it mean to be a learning culture? and using data to um, make program improvements and to um, articulate the need for additional resources or different types of resources to funders. How do you manage that kind of change? So if it's the first time that you've started to implement um, measures and accountability and pilot and revise, that's, that's a big change for a program or an organization. So how does that get managed? How do you program, how do you make improvements based on the, the stuff you're collecting? And if you're not making improvements, why bother collecting it? Right? Uh, I think there's a whole movement, especially across the state and hopefully in the country, around equity and inclusion. So how are we making sure that we're serving all the people who need to be served and sometimes aren't uh, well served? Then in the middle column, there's some things that we've been thinking about in terms of actual tools around um, how, to, how to collect the data and why to collect the data um, and how to make those improvements. So linking the theory of change to logic model, models, qualitative and quantitative data. Um, I'm, I happen to be uh, sort of the expert, one of the experts in results-based accountability, which is a no jargon, repeatable process that may be useful. Uh, how, do we dis how do we discern between short and long-term impact, especially if we have people only for a short period of time, but we're being asked to measure on a long-term uh, basis? That gets to be a little tricky. And then um, maybe introduction of rubrics. Once you've identified your strategies, how do you get the whole team on board to um, understand uh, qu qualitatively what that looks like and kind of create a path for improvement from we're doing okay to how do we really thrive? And then finally, the, really the nitty gritties about data. Survey method and design, how do you do participatory approaches to those, um, those data collection and analysis, uh, data collection and storage. I think storage often bogs folks down. It's good the year one or two, and then you sort of look up at year 10 and go, oh my God, I'm kind of overwhelmed by this data. How do you use technology for efficiency, uh, the analysis and reporting components, and then the population versus program data are just some of the ideas that we've been thinking about for the upcoming two years. It's probably more. All right. So that's enough of Beth and I talking. Now we want to turn it over to you because, again, this is... Um, this whole process will be guided by the participants, right? And so in order to be in service to you and to improve your effectiveness and answer the questions you have, uh, really want to be driven by your questions, your concerns. So questions about what's been presented and then also your ideas for what might um, really benefit you. Well, we're opening it up. Don't forget to turn off your mic if you're muted. So go ahead and just uh, chime right in. If you have a question, if, there, if you have questions about anything we've talked about so far, or go ahead and also jump in if you um, if there's something that's a, a, a priority or an interest of yours. Uh, this is Liz. I have a question about different frameworks. How much Will this training program focus on utilizing things like RBA or other frameworks? I think it's, um, I, my, my sense is, and I'll step in and Beth can answer them too, is that multiple frameworks will be offered and then it's up to you to decide if you want to test and run with it. Um, I'm a big believer in um, 
pilot and fail fast and hard if it's not the one for you. So hopefully there's multiple options for you to pick from and you land on a framework that will work for you and your program. None of it's required that you actually tackle them. It'll be presented and then you get to decide to test it, see if it can work, and then move on to the next one or then dive in deeper on the ones that seem to be working for you. I think if people have frameworks that they're already using um, and they're looking um, to do more of the things that were in the, um, the third column, if those are the pressing things, um, that's where they'll be focusing. And if people really feel like they need to um, be more in the left-hand column, um, that's where they'll be. And that's some of how um, we'll be thinking about grouping people together so that the people that they're working with uh, have mutual interests and are um, working in the same area. Anybody else have questions? Does everybody just have eating their lunch? <laughs> I guess the other way to phrase it, is there, um, what in what's been presented sounds appealing, if anything? There's got to be something, folks. <laughs> I guess I'd, um, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by what was presented. I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what would benefit us. I think I have to kind of steep on this a little bit, but in relation to the water quality sampling work that we're doing as part of my RCPP project, we've collected all the pre-data and I'm halfway through my RCPP project and so now there are projects that are being implemented and so we'll collect water quality data for the post-implementation. Um, and so I have lots of water quality data, so total phosphorus, total nitrogen, and, the, and that data speaks volumes, I think, in and itself. But what I've been thinking about recently is how do I evaluate a human reaction to that data? I think there's a lot of opportunity in the setup of this program that I have developed in documenting how seeing actual on the ground data affects change on farms. And of course, the data I'm collecting so far is it, it, just water chemistry information. And so I've been trying to think a lot about when I present the data to the farms, creating some sort of evaluation sheet that I collect um, at the visit where I'm you know, presenting the data just based on the reactions that they have, potential improvements because of the information, I, I don't really know. So I think that that's what seems intriguing to me is to have somebody to kind of look at what I have so far, what I'm envisioning, what I'm thinking, what my who my participants are, and then also what the end goal is with that information. And I think it's a very compelling story. I think about sharing with legislators, I think about sharing with select board members, community, you know, to get the word out that farmers are doing things, we do have actual data. And I also think, in my experience working with farmers, it's a ubiquitous problem, right? It's non-point source pollution, it's everywhere. Whereas this data really kind of shows it, it is act, it's actually there, you know? Um, and so I think it, it helps move the needle further. And so I think part of my goal is really just to fund this in the future. I want to continue to be able to do that work and to be able to build it out a little bit more, but I'm not sure how to capture it really. So I'm I'm struck by the the connection of what you're what you're already doing is really effective and working and how do you take that to the next level, right? Yeah. Everything has to be manageable. If you take on too much at once, it won't succeed. So yeah. um, it sounds like you've got really great grounding in some of the big data that you need that's really tied to the work. And the next step is um, might be how do you how do you gauge a measure of your efforts in terms of changing attitudes and opinions? and moving folks to action, which is, you know, that can be, you can design something that can start to capture that. And then the other piece is uh, the storytelling and reporting behind data, right? So again, data, you know, why collect it beyond what funders are requesting, which is never a really compelling reason. It's um, really to improve our programs, create some strategies, 
and to tell a story that helps support the, that that big goal. So mm -hmm. I think you're talking about the next the next level of work for your um, your data collection and analysis. Right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure, I'll say something. This is Jeff down in Middlebury. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. I did. Speak. Cool. Go ahead. Well, this this idea of evaluation is great. Um, I think part of my problem is is that we need to evaluate about fifteen different things. So it'd be nice to be able to focus in on what's a really critical thing to evaluate. Mm -hmm. When I said about you know, trying to get information for funding. It's, it's also got to do with, um, so, you know, I spent a lot of money on a newsletter. How do I know if people are reading it, if they value it, if they made a change because of it? Yeah. I mean, it's a feel good thing, but at some point you have to justify it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what I'm gonna be looking for is, is that how do we come up with that without it burdening us with a lot of time. I mean, basically, this evaluation and, and looking at all that does take time. So it's like, how do we figure out what are the right, most important things to evaluate quickly? I see a lot of surveys and evaluations that um, after about five questions, I just crumple it up and throw it away. So how do I do evaluations that get right to the heart of it without um, putting off our clients who tend to not do these sorts of things. I think you, you've landed on something that's really important. I think often what happens if, if we've stepped into a program or uh, a history of funding and maybe even some of that funding has gone away, sometimes we inherit um, measurement tools and processes that aren't relevant or don't tell us what we need to know. And often it's overwhelming. And so I think part of the conversation is um, one, how do you prioritize your evaluation tools so that you can actually manage them without drowning in them? How do you decide what the most important data points are um, with great intention? Now, that doesn't mean you can get rid of, you know, the things that the funders request and require. You can't get rid, you can't really get rid of them, but you can collect it and not actually do anything with it. You can just send it along and it's, if it's not important to you, you know, you don't spend time discussing or analyzing, you just give them the data and say, here you go. Um, but what, what's helpful to you? And then how do you use the data not only to make improvements to your work, but also to prioritize your work? Because all of us, all of us are working with fewer resources, fewer people, fewer hours, fewer dollars. And so we've got to get really smart about um, what's the most impactful strategies that we want to embrace and work with. So you, you've named a really important big question about why, why bother to go through this kind of process. This is Kirsten, I think, and also something Jeff mentioned, but I'll reiterate is, I feel like sometimes our clientele is slightly over-surveyed. Mm -hmm. um, one example was that like the one actual place we've done a consistent, I won't say maybe effective or good, but consistent job of doing surveys or evaluations on programming has been at this annual conference we do. And last year, I think there were like five different types or organizations trying to survey that population. So that impacted a like the amount of people that finished our survey by the end of the day, which was the last one they saw because they'd already filled out three or four. Um, and then just in general to be like kind of like, you know, lean and mean about what the questions are we asking and willing down to things that are really important and things that people will answer and answer in a way that is useful for us to use that information. Everything, and that's true for both practice adoption and attitudes about practice adoption as well as like effectiveness of our programming and what they want to see moving forward so like i right now that survey is like two pages long and i can see it getting even longer because we tend to sort of default to it because we know we know we're going to do it so we'll add extra questions about how much money people spend on practices and all this other information we should be collecting maybe different parts of the year um but trying to whittle that down to questions and information and uh you know metrics that are actually useful so two things come to mind, um, maybe three. The first one is um, the value of collaboration. So again, you're right, or surveyed. Uh, it, it, it tends to be a tool that is overused. 
Uh, so looking for ways to collaborate and in the data collection world, um, there might be some opportunity there. Um, it requires sharing information and um, spending some time together and building some trust, but it's possible. I think the other, the other piece, and I think this is true on the grant making side too, um, if you're asking a question, um, you better know why you're asking that question and to what end are you using that information and is it essential or are you just curious and your curiosity isn't really sufficient to waste someone's time so what what is most essential and is there um as you look at your your questions um are you are you being sort of redundant are you asking towards the same end four different ways and would one question suffice and i most often I see this happening is that we're, we're, we're asking it four or five different ways um, when once would be sufficient. So it might be a question of refining and um, creating that one question and looking at, it's also, so this is more than three things. I think maybe the other piece is that it's linked a little bit to theory of change. So if we do this, this happens, and there's sort of a sequence of events, which one do you have to ask about in order to have assurance that the work you're doing is leading to that theory of change? You may not be able to broker every step of the way, but what's the most important one you get to that? Does that help? Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. You're welcome. So I think these are all um, really important, great questions and the kinds of things um, we'll want to dive into over the course of the program. Um, and having you share with us what's on your mind helps us to figure out um, a little bit of the sequencing and making sure that we're getting, you know, and we'll learn more in the self-assessment and your application um, to get you tools and build skills that you can use <clears throat> in 2019 and then build on them again to use them in 2020 um, as you're doing work. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so I, ha I have a question. Um, one, one of my, my concerns with the data I gather from evaluations is um, whether I can automatize evaluation data to see red flags and to have feedbacks to contact farmers or particular farmers that um, have certain um, um, ideas or opinions and you know, whether it's possible to centralize this data to see trends, potential trends that can help me address them. And as Jeff said, um, you know, see how to, how to um, you know, work with this data so that I can see potential new areas for research, basically. And this is one of us at UVM campus. Yeah. I'm going to defer to Beth on that one because she, She's been talking about using technology for efficiency and getting advanced looks at trends and whatnot. I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure I completely understood your question, Juan. Um, and, but I would be happy to talk more about your situation so I can offer some suggestions. Yeah. And the whole issue of um, how can we make sure that we're using technology to streamline what we're doing and not adding or the trade-offs, at least being cognizant of the trade-offs when we're implementing new um, technology to help us keep track of data um, is, is something I'm really interested um, in. And in my work, I have had, I think, some successes and, um, and encountered some challenges that I am going to be happy to share with people and and to learn from what you all are doing too. Yeah, um, because you know, right now what, what I do is I, I, you know, as anyone else, I, I give away um, evaluation forms where people, you know, will uh, fill it out and, and, and send it to me um, at the end of the workshop or session. And I wanna know if there could be some type of um, uh, either online platform or maybe a, software that I can install in a couple of computers where people can go there and in like one minute or maybe 30 seconds, they can, you know, check boxes and this data will feed a database that will produce sort of, you know, survey results basically. And then I, I, I could see red flags. I could see feedback from, from people. 
uh, in a in a much faster way uh, instead of you know me having to you know get you know 50 evaluation evaluation forms and have to digest them and put them in a, in a spreadsheet things like that basically um, um, yeah I think there are definitely tools that can help you do that and um, and I, I, and I we can work on that great thank you and I assume we're gonna go beyond just surveys and then like what Juan's talking about is you know, these interactive questions that you ask during a session and you get instant feedback and that's recorded but it's not in a compiled database it's only for that one event i can't say the name of it. it's the one you answer on your phone while they're talking right right yeah i mean those are things that we i'd like to be able to talk about as part of this you so like using clickers and not clickers you got your cell phone the guy's giving a talk up front and he has a question up there and then everybody in the audience gets to answer and the answer goes right up on the board right yeah yeah same idea yeah yeah we can definitely incorporate that yeah just i mean to me evaluation is is not just surveys and i will i will say that i um i have been researching that for another project that i'm working on and if I'm understanding what the um, software people for this tell me is you can, um, you actually, if you do the same presentation in multiple places, you can aggregate all that, that data into one place. Um, and and um, you can, you know, compare locations and you can aggregate, you can do stuff like that um, if you have it set up right. So yeah. there's a yeah, but, investment but of time and learning to get it right. And then, yes, then you get to see things that you weren't able to see before. Um, so yeah, that would be really interesting to look at. So I'm looking at the time, we're at um, 12.59, and if there's somebody who hasn't um, um, chimed in who has something they wanna add, um, that would be great. You can also, um, uh, email or call me um, and I'm happy to talk with you about um, uh, any questions you have or concerns you have, um, making sure that the fit is right. Um, and, um, and just to encourage you to, if you are interested, to um, go ahead and submit an application um, before the 21st or by the end of the day on the 21st. So before we sign up, is there anybody else who wants to chime in? Okay, I'm hearing um, silence. So thank you all for taking your lunchtime on a Friday to join us. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope to talk to you and see you online. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.